Good afternoon. I'm Michael Sabia. I'm the director of the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. So on behalf of the school and on behalf of uh, our co-host, uh, Ambassador Sparwasser, Germany's ambassador to Canada, I want to welcome you all uh, here this afternoon to a discussion of what I think is one of the 20th century's defining events, and that is the reunification of Germany and everything that it meant for Germany, but for Europe, and even more broadly than that, for the global order itself. It's a tradition at the University of Toronto to acknowledge that our school uh, stands on the traditional lands of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississauga of the Credit River. As I said, German reunification was an important, a very important event in the 20th century. It's a fascinating subject. Um, and in order to discuss a fascinating subject, you need a fascinating panel. I think we have that today. So I also, of course, want to welcome um, two members of the panel, Senator Ratna Omervar and Professor Alexander Reisenbleacher. Um, I also want to thank our moderator um, this afternoon, Peter Mansbridge. Now, all of you who are Canadian, um, for you, Peter certainly needs no introduction at all because he has been in our living rooms for decades. Uh, I think it's fair to say that there are very, very few important public conversations in Canada that Peter has not been a part of. So Peter, I want to welcome you and thank you uh, for doing this today. Um, in particular, I want to welcome Canada's 18th Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Brian Mulroney. I had the, uh, the real pleasure of serving in Canada's public service while Prime Minister Mulroney was in office. And I can say, in my opinion, among many, many other achievements uh, that have stood Canada in very good stead over the years and decades, during his years in office, the Prime Minister practiced just what I describe as a special kind of foreign policy, something that drew very heavily on his unique capability to conduct personal diplomacy. Personal diplomacy based on a a person-to-person -person connection with leaders around the world, but in particular, certainly with uh, the presidents of the United States, both Ronald Reagan and George Bush, uh, with Nelson Mandela, uh, that gave Canada a special role in the ending of apartheid, and of course, with Helmut Kohl, who played a starring role, who played a starring role in, uh, in, today's, uh, in today's subject. Those relationships, those personal relationships that the Prime Minister was able to establish, they paid big dividends to Canada and to our role in the world. So Prime Minister, welcome. Uh, it's an honor to welcome you to the University of Toronto. I know um, that uh, you were and are very close friends, uh, were with Peter, with Peter Monk and, and still are with Melanie Monk. Uh, so it's a special pleasure to welcome you to the Monk School. Our school, of course, bears their name. So with that, I'll turn it over to our co-host, uh, Ambassador Sabine Sparbasser. Uh, the ambassador has served Germany in so many capacities and in so many places around the world that I could go through a long list uh, of places around the world. It would be a good geography class. Uh, but I think instead of doing that, I'll just acknowledge this is a public servant, a distinguished public servant uh, of Germany. And with that, Ambassador, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, well, welcome and thank you all for joining us in celebrating 30 uh, years of German unity. Uh, these days, when everything is about keeping borders closed, when people must stay apart, when the very idea of democracy is challenged in so many countries, uh, we thought it would do us good to look back on what happened 30 years ago. Uh, when brave citizens in East Germany tore down the murderous wall, when they fought in a peaceful revolution for freedom and democracy, and they fought for unity. So from the October 3rd, so tomorrow, um, 1990, grew together what belongs together, and that was Willy Brandt who said that. It was a happy ending, and it was a new beginning. 
now looking back, we shudder at the thought of so much that could have gone easily wrong all the way. So many elements needed to come together to make German unity a reality at the time. Courageous citizens, responsible international leaders on all sides, a multilateral system that allowed for dialogue and allowed for compromise. Germany needed and it had so much luck. And even more so, Germany needed and it had uh, uh, very real friends. Canada was such a friend. I'm immensely grateful to the former Prime Minister of Canada, the Right Honourable Brian Mulroney, for his crucial role of advocacy amongst G7 leaders for German unification. Thank you for that. Thank you so much also for being here today. It's a great honour. I'm delighted that Senator Ratna Omidwar, who has done so much for fostering diversity in my country as it grew together, has accepted the invitation. And thank you to Professor Weisenbichler. And in particular, thank you to the Monk School of Global Affairs and its director, Michael Sabia, and also to Joseph, to Daria, to Adam, for hosting this event and for organizing this event with us. You are to my embassy, what Canada is to Germany, the best partner imaginable. Two quick last points. I know that many of you have personal stories of German unification to share. We would love to hear them. Please go to our website, sogerman.ca, share your story. And last point, on our national day, we really want to offer German hospitality to all of you, but we can't. So we have asked you how we should go about it. And you have overwhelmingly voted for us to help people in need instead. So today and tomorrow, we're serving on your behalf, pretzels, sausages, sauerbraten, and spätzle to food banks in many cities in Canada. And now I come to my once in a lifetime moment, and I've been looking forward to that for a long time. I get to say the words that we all have heard so often on the national. Over to Peter Mansbridge. Well, Ambassador, thank you uh, so much for that. A wonderful uh, introduction and a, a wonderful use of um, your country's goodwill in terms of uh, supplying uh, special quality foods to food banks uh, in different places as a result of this anniversary and as a result of this panel. Uh, before I get started, I really should um, do a little housekeeping because one of the reasons we do this is not only to exchange views of the experts that you've already heard mentioned, but also to hear your questions of them. Um, so if we can just throw up on the screen the, uh, some, some of the uh, facts that you'll need if you want to write in to uh, talk to us here on this uh, program. Um, you can use the Zoom Q&A tool via Twitter to at Monk School, or by email to events.monk at utoronto.ca. So there you have it. You can use the Zoom tool. You can go to Twitter and at Monk School or email at events.monk at utoronto.ca. I don't know uh, how many of you have seen, had the chance when there was a Broadway, had the chance to go to Broadway and see Hamilton. But one of the great songs in Hamilton is um, being in the room at the time. What happened in the room? He saw what happened in the room. He was in the room where it happens. Well, our first guest was certainly in a lot of rooms where a lot of things happened and a lot of things that were key and instrumental to why we're here today to talk about the 30th anniversary of the reunification of Germany. And that, of course, is, as mentioned already, the Right Honourable Brian Mulroney. 18th Prime Minister of Canada. He joins us uh, from Montreal today, where uh, he has his home, and he's at his home today in Montreal. So, Prime Minister, first of all, before I throw the first question at you, thank you so much for joining us. We all really appreciate it. Thank you, Peter, very much. I'm honoured to be with you today. It's a special occasion, a special event in the life of Germany, but also in the evolution of Canada as a player on the world scene. So. I'm delighted to be with you. That's great. One of the 
things that people of our age grew up believing in many ways was that the Berlin Wall was always going to be there, that the Cold War was never going to end. In 1985, you were in the room or in a room where a pretty key player in the big international scene gave you reason to doubt that, that it would be there forever. And that was very early on. Can you share that story with us? Yeah, what it was, Peter, was a um, President Reagan at the United Nations, the American mission, had convened a dinner of the G7 leaders who were at the United Nations for other reasons. And he wanted to discuss exclusively the Cold War and how he hoped to bring it to an end with the cooperation of all of the allies. So we had the dinner on that. Uh, there were the seven of us, G7. And at the end of the dinner, there was kind of coffee and conversation. I had been fascinated over many years with the separation of Germany. And I was intrigued by how it was going, and the, you know, all of the espionage and the secrets that were flowing around. And I had been talking to Kelmet, Helmut Kohl from the beginning, uh, which in my case was only about a year, a year and a half earlier, about the situation. So at the coffee clutch, I said, uh, now Helmut, the meeting's over. What do you think about uh, German reunification? And he said, um, well, Brian, it's going to happen. And uh, I said, well, when do you think it's going to happen? And he said, well, I don't know when it'll happen, but I'm sure it, it will happen one day. And I said, what's going what's to be the motor of this? What's going to bring it about? And Cole said, television. And Margaret Thatcher interrupts and says, Helmut, what's so great about German television that... Uh, <laughs> that's going to bring this about. And Cole said, Margaret, the commercials. She said, what are you talking about? And he said, 97% of East Germans receive West German television. And every night they see these marvelous consumer goods that are available to everybody in West Germany. And when the East Germans want this badly enough for themselves, the wall is coming down. <laughs> and he said, I don't know when, but I know for sure it's going to happen. And that was the that was the anecdote that launched a, a, a thousand ships for the G7. I'll tell you. Well, it wasn't that long after, actually. It was another four years or so that takes us to November of 1989. And I remember the day when the wall started to come down. I mean, a number of things had already happened by then, but that was the significant moment. And when the wall started to come down, I was in Ottawa covering you at a first ministers conference where you were discussing with the premiers among other things, dare I say, at the Meech Lake Accord. Yeah. Nevertheless, um, there you were talking about it, and I kept getting these kind of little bulletins uh, handed over to me saying what was happening in Berlin. The later it went in the afternoon, the later it was at night in Berlin. And uh, it, clearly, a huge story was unfolding uh, while we were covering the First Minister's Conference. And I've always wondered, you must have been getting past information uh, intelligence from either diplomatic circles or, or security services telling you as well at that moment what was going on in Berlin. Precisely. And uh, I remember the conference well, uh, Peter, and immediately or shortly thereafter, I left on a state visit to Moscow uh, with meetings with Gorbachev. And as it happened, I was in Moscow with him. Helmut Kohl, when it happened, uh, was um, on a state visit to Poland, I believe. And he interrupted the visit and rushed back to Berlin to ensure the stability of the upcoming governments, whatever they might turn out to be. And I was with for five days in Moscow and spent a lot of time with Gorbachev, and who was um, an out, really an outstanding leader and will be so recognized in history. But he was pretty adamant that there would be no German reunification. He was very much opposed to it because of the pressure being brought on him by his military intelligentsia there in Moscow. And so th that was the beginning of a dialogue that I had with him where I told him, I said, you know, if you want to be remembered in history, you're going to have to acknowledge that this is going to happen. Germany is going to be reunited. And I said, President Bush is in favor of it. Uh, I, Canada is certainly in favor of it. But most of all, Helmut Kohl and his 
very important skills are going to be at work there. And uh, one thing for sure is he said, there cannot be German reunification uh, unless the country remains neutral outside of NATO. I didn't push too hard except to tell him that's not going to happen, Miguel. Uh, that's not going to happen. And so what the next step, Peter, as you'll remember, was the meetings in Ottawa, uh, which was going to be the Open Skies Conference, but which turned into something else. Well, let's get to that in a, in, a, in a second, because I I just want to go back a little bit, because I can remember when I got to Berlin after being in Ottawa and, and it was covering the story in those early days. Um, it's easy to look back now and say, oh, well, it was obvious what was going to happen. Well, it wasn't obvious. Uh, nobody knew for sure exactly how this was going to unfold, because while you were working the Gorbachev angle and the Bush angle as well, um, there was... I'm not sure if resistance is the right word, but there was certainly concern in Paris and London on the part of uh, Mitterrand and Thatcher about this whole idea of German reunification. Oh, very much so. Margaret was deathly opposed to it. Uh, she had her own memories of the Second World War, uh, but uh, she, and she had her own amount of bias in it. Uh, and she was, she was just opposed to it in principle. And I always thought, that one of the reasons would be that in those days, uh, the leading powers in Europe had essentially the same population, roughly 50, 55 million, and roughly the same size economies, led by Germany, of course, but the same size. And this would add 19 or 20 million East Germans to the, to the pot in West Germany. And this would transform the power balance that existed so well in Europe for so many years. And she was opposed to that. The Dutch were ferociously opposed. Didn't even want to talk about it when I mentioned it to them. You know, they kind of you want to throw you out of the room. Uh, and that were the memories of the, um, of the war as well, were deep antipathies uh, below the surface. Uh, and so um, eventually this had to, be, had to be broken down. And it really was by the brilliant leadership of Helmut Kohl and George Herbert Walker Bush. Um, I can remember when I came back from that Moscow trip, President Bush called me and asked me to come down for dinner because uh, in that time frame, uh, he was getting set to, the, to go to Malta to meet Gorbachev. And he wanted a full debrief on what I had learned in my five days with him. And I did that and he made it certain, certainly clear to me, uh, Peter, that um, you know, we, we were talking, from the, we were singing from the same song sheet he and I. And he said, there is no, no way that um, we can let this either fail, so in other words, it has to succeed. And you're right, we cannot have Germany, a united Germany, outside of NATO. The, um, the, the way you draw the map on this, it's clear that there were major powers involved, starting obviously with, with Germany. You've got Moscow, you've got Washington, you've got London, you've got Paris, and you've got Ottawa. Now, you mentioned the Ottawa Conference and Open Skies. Explain to us how Ottawa became a player with those heavyweights in what was a major kind of reshuffling of the Mac, map and reshuffling of the world in many ways uh, in those particular days. Well, it starts with the friendship that Helmut Kohl and I developed in the course of uh, five or six years prior to uh, the wall coming down. Uh, we became pretty fast friends and uh, we, we spoke a lot on the phone and uh, I certainly shared his vision of United Germany and he knew it. I was all for it and I talked about it at G7 meetings, in the margins of G7 meetings, at NATO conferences and in the margins of NATO conferences as well. So he knew that he had an ally in Canada. And I'll tell you, one of the reasons, Peter, that he didn't have too many allies uh, with most of the Europeans, almost all of the European countries opposed to German reunification for the reasons I mentioned earlier. And so when it happened, when it, when it was building up, uh, Cole, and of course he knew that my friendship with President Bush, and he knew that we were in constant communication ourselves on that. And he would, without 
reluctance, inject himself into those conversations. And sometimes he would call me and ask me to, to, to pass on some private information to President Bush, uh, which I would do. And so by the time we got to what was a, supposed to be a conference on, on uh, open skies, it was very rapidly transformed uh, in, uh, into uh, a conference on the reunification of Germany. It began at my residence, the Prime Minister's residence at 24 Sussex, with a breakfast meeting with Edward Shevardnadze, James Baker III, Joe Clark, and myself. And they, Baker under instructions from Bush and Shevardnadze, knowing what was going to happen and, and, and wanting to hold it back as much as he could on Gorbachev's behalf, but knowing it was going to happen. That morning at breakfast, for two hours, we talked about the reunification of Germany and the way we're going to use the conference, which was all of the NATO members and the Warsaw Pact. How are we going to use that conference to transform it into an understanding, a basic understanding on German reunification? And that's what happened. How tenuous was it at that point? Um, could it all have fallen apart or was, could you see, a, could you always see a path forward that this was going to work or was there the potential that people were going to walk away from? It? The Soviet Union was the most important player in this because had they resisted uh, and threatened military resistance, Gorbachev had just been in East Germany and he had been received like a king uh, by the people. Uh, like a couple of months ahead, uh, before that. And so, yes, uh, the reason for the, all the effort that President Bush in particular, and I and, and some others, placed on the relationship with Gorbachev was to bring him along to acceptance, but in a way that would respect his dignity and the strength of the reputation of the Soviet Union at that time, even though they were in decline. So yeah, it could have, it could have gone uh, belly up at any time. And that's why uh, the Ottawa conference was so fortuitous as it turned out. In fact, Peter had a lot of understandings that we were gonna have the two plus four, the two Germanys looking after the domestic side and the four occupying powers looking after external relations. And, and that's the way it advanced uh, with um, Canada kind of playing a role of, um, of flying wing uh, in this with the Americans and the other allies. I remember after the conference was over, uh, Hans Dietrich Genscher, who was the foreign minister, had been the foreign minister for a long time. And of course, I used to see him at every conference and we got along just fine. He was a minority party, uh, representing a minority party in Cole's coalition at the time. And he was a brilliant guy. Genscher was a very effective foreign minister, I thought, anyway. So he comes to see me in my parliamentary office. Uh, and so we talked to him. He, he said, I want to thank you in Canada for the tremendous success of this. We've really moved uh, German reunification along a great deal. We're getting practical about it. And that's very, very helpful. At the end of which, I, his, con his conversation, I said, well, um, Hans Dietrich, tell me uh, on a, in a practical way. How is this going to work? Uh, and he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, you know, you've got the GDR and you coming together. For example, I said, take your ministry. Uh, who is going to appoint uh, the ambassador to Washington or to Paris or to London? From what side will they come? And he said to me, they're not going to appoint anything. I said, what do you mean? He said, we're going to appoint them all. And I said, well, this, I guess this is not a merger, right? He said, no, it's a takeover, <laughs> which, it was, which it was. But when you think about it, it had to be. There, was, there could only be one driver in this, and it had to be the powerful uh, German Republic, West German Republic. When you look back at that period of, uh, you know, high stakes diplomacy, yeah. no question about it. When you look back at that period, which is, you know, 30 years ago now, uh, what lessons from that time could be applied to what we're witnessing now on the international stage? I know it's a funny day to, 
to ask that question given the events that have, have taken place at the White House in the last 24 hours. But setting that aside for the moment, just in terms of the, the international picture and the way uh, countries relate to each other, especially the countries that were instrumental in this uh, particular venture, what are the lessons from then that could be applied to today? Well, if you're looking at it from a Canadian perspective, Peter, the Prime Minister has to engage, be engaged personally in the relationships of the important leaders in the world. He's got particularly the United States, irrespective of whom the president turns out to be. He's got to be down there. He's got to work both sides of that street, including the media, the interest groups, the White House. He has got to have, like we've had, privileged access to the United States of America and its president. He's got to be in the Oval Office on a regular basis. Because Canada, with that, we're able to leverage our influence uh, many times over. Uh, because a lot of countries, you know, there are 200 countries just about in the United Nations. All of their presidents or prime ministers trying to get into the White House. We used to be able to walk in there. Uh, somebody just pointed out to me a little while ago that, that on this, just on this, I was in the White House seven times to meet with President Bush and dozens and dozens of phone calls on, on every aspect of this. You have to have that because other countries wonder what Canada's influence is with the United States. And if it's apparent that uh, it was hunky-dory as it was with President Reagan and President Bush and President Clinton in my case, then you move along very quickly on your own bilateral agendas, but also the perception and the reality of influence that, uh, that a medium-sized country like Canada can't have in the state of international play. Without that, you're on the sidelines. And, and anybody who tries to tell you uh, anything different from that, I think has never been at a G7 meeting uh, or inside the Oval Office very often, because that's the way it works. Prime Minister, uh, <laughs> it's been great listening to you tell these anecdotes from, from that period. I don't want you to go away. I want you to stay with us uh, as we continue this on. But before I introduce the next two uh, panelists. I'll just tell one my one little anecdote that I like to think of, although I didn't it didn't cross my mind obviously at, at the moment. But I, when I was on at the wall broadcasting the national back to Canada during that that particular weekend, right? It was a Thursday night. The wall came down, and then through the Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I mean, they continued on knocking the wall down, and and the kind of street parties that were going on around it. What I didn't realize until much later was on the other side of the wall from where I was broadcasting, there was a young East German uh, student who was on that wall as part of those demonstrations. It was over there, uh, not that far away. Um, and she was Angela Merkel. Really? She, she yeah, she took, uh, she took part in those, those demonstrations around the wall coming down. And uh, she was, I think, a chemistry student or physics or something, whatever it was, something that I would never have understood if I got into a conversation with her. But nevertheless, that's where she was. Well, that's um, a wonderful story. She, yeah, and then she obviously had a, uh, has had a huge impact uh, on the world and in the way she's carried through from that uh, new freedom that was exhibited in her country um, through the work of, of people like you, uh, Prime Minister. So. Uh, I'm sure she appreciates that as well as, as we do. Um, okay, I want to introduce two uh, of our other panelists here to take this conversation a little uh, further in terms of especially what's happened since that period. Uh, we have two uh, people. I, we've got Senator uh, Ratna Omidvar, who is an internationally recognized voice on migration, diversity, and inclusion. In April of 2016, uh, the senator was appointed to the Senate of Canada as an independent senator representing Ontario. As a member of the Senate's independent senators group, she holds a leadership position as liaison. The senator is a counselor on the World Refugee Council, a director at the Samara Centre for Democracy, and chair emerita for the Toronto Region Immigrant Employment Council. Also joining us here is uh, Alexander Reisenbichler, is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Toronto, 
and a research coordinator of the Joint Initiative in German and European Studies at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. He'll be a John F. Kennedy Memorial Fellow at the Center for European Studies at Harvard University in 2021 and 22. Hope you actually get to go to Harvard to do that and not, not do it online or take a Zoom course like we're doing today. All right, well, as the, uh, the, the Prime Minister is gonna stay with us because I'm sure he's gonna wanna jump in at, on occasion on, on, on some of these issues as well. But uh, let, let me start, uh, Senator, with you. Um, multinational, this kind of in a way picks up on some of the things that the Prime Minister and I were talking about just a moment ago. Multinational institutions like NATO and the G7 held many meetings in 89 and 90 that played key roles in what followed. There are concerns today that they aren't as effective now. Has their importance changed? How could they be more effective today than they are right now? And I see you're holding the phone to your ear, so uh, we, uh, or, oh no, you're not. Okay, sorry, that's just a bad picture on my side. I'm assuming you heard that, it was your headphone that got me mixed up there. My headphone, uh, yes. More effective today. I think, uh, in fact, you know, and thank you for that journey down memory. It's so important to remember what happened in the past so we can work more confidently towards the future. Uh, I think that multilateral in institutions uh, are under threat. The rule of law is under threat. And there are a few like-minded jurisdictions like Germany and Canada, that, and there are others, and we need to work with them to continue to strengthen the existing multilateral uh, institutions as best we can. And I take Prime Minister Moroni's point well, that if bilateral arrangements work well, then they also propel you towards improved uh, conversations and dialogues at the multilateral level. I think Canada needs to be, you know, as a, as a, as a middle country, as a, as a country that doesn't pull the same weight as the United States. And I would say even as the super economic powerhouse of Germany, we play a role because we do things well here and we can put forward how Peace, good order, peace, order, and good governance, which works really well here. I mean, there are no absolutes always in this conversation, but we can propel our understanding and our learning to other, uh, other platforms. Of course, our relationship with the United States will continue to be a very important one, and I take the Prime Minister's point really uh, to heart. We have to do everything we can, not just president to prime minister, but also, you know, parliamentarian to parliamentarian, as, as, as I do, as best as I can, to develop those uh, strands of relationships, personal, substantial, as they may be, on substantive matters or on other matters, and propel forward our common understanding of what makes democracies work. So, Multilateralism has never been more important, and I think Germany and Canada are called upon to do more uh, in these difficult times than we are currently possibly doing. Professor, do you want to add to that? Uh, sure. Uh, thank you very much. Um, let me actually start with a personal note. Um, without reunification and all the fascinating multilateral efforts um, that we just heard about, um, I would not be sitting on this panel and I would not be sitting in Toronto in my office because reunification opened doors for an entire generation of East Germans, um, including myself, who were still born in the GDR and grew up in a reunified Germany. And it allowed us to seize opportunities that our parents and grandparents um, could not have imagined. And so I'd very much like to recognize the prime minister's efforts in contributing to the multilateralism at the time that helped bring about reunification. And on, on, to answer your question on multilateralism, I think for all its problems, the EU is actually a very effective multilateral institution that has become even stronger since reunification and in part also because of reunification. As the prime minister mentioned, uh, some feared that a, a unified Germany um, would be a destabilizing force in Europe, but those fears were uh, misplaced and a united Germany has been a strong liberal democracy and an anchor of stability and also driving force for more cooperation and European integration. And since reunification, Germany has become an economic powerhouse 
and helped steer through a number of crises from the Eurozone migration crisis, Brexit, and now COVID. And uh, on a side note, I've been quite critical on Angela Merkel's Eurozone crisis policies. But the larger point is that for obvious historical reasons, Germany is uncomfortable and reluctant in its leadership position and has mostly resorted to normative economic and diplomatic power. But I think it needs to get um, a little bit more comfortable in this position in order to deal with these geopolitical challenges that we just discussed or are about to discuss. And so one way to do that is that Germany has to exercise power through multilateral institutions and above all through the EU and NATO. And so I think that reunification was a, a massive triumph for the liberal order and for the European Union because it led to a stronger Germany, which led to a stronger Europe, and as a result to stronger multilateralism on the global stage. And this is something positive that we um, often forget in an age of Trump and, and Brexit. Well, yeah, let me pick that up because, uh, you know, I, I think that's the fear and, and the questioning of, of what middle powers, if you want to use that term, on uh, Canada and to some degree Germany, need to do to respond to the kind of things we're seeing in our world today of unilateralism and isolationism and nationalism. Because um, it does make you wonder, you know, whether the international rules-based order is in some kind of jeopardy right now. And if it is, what do we need to do beyond having you know, sort of better one-to-one -one relationships between leaders or parliamentarians. Um, Senator, do you want to try that? I, th I think uh, we are all right to be concerned. Uh, my work on the World Refugee uh, and Migration Council, which looked at these kinds of arrangements breaking down and what can be inserted to revive them, sort of led me to one conclusion that when multilateralism is breaking down, maybe you need to create regional arrangements that may in fact uh, help resolve a crisis. Uh, you know, let's say the Myanmar refugee crisis, which has, uh, has, is, is, is a real blight on the world and the, the failure of nation states uh, to, um, to share the responsibility as they should has, is apparent. And, but possibly it's regional arrangements, Thailand, Burma, uh, uh, Malaysia, India working together uh, to resolve such a situation could be, could be a, a solution. I'm not suggesting that we leave multilateralism aside, but we look for other expressions of working together, whether it's bilaterally or regionally. I, I think we are at a time when we have to look at new models uh, for new times. Prime Minister, do, do you want to um, venture into this one? I mean, is the international rules-based order in jeopardy right now? Well, it's um, ailing because of the attitudes of the American presidency. Uh, they've uh, spent more time praising uh, our enemies uh, than, than praising our allies and our, and our friends. So it's been, a, uh, it's been a, a, a bit of a reversal for us, but it's still of vital importance and uh, it has to be maintained and it will. It, it give you an idea, Peter, to come back to our earlier discussions about German reunification. After the Ottawa conference uh, in February of 1990, President Gorbachev comes to visit me in May of 1990 on a state visit. And he is going off down to see President Bush. And he arrives to tell me the story that it, having visited with his colleagues in the Soviet Union and heard the opposition, that there can be no there can be no German reunification uh, unless Germany is neutral, has a policy of neutrality, and no membership in NATO. And I said to him, and that gives you an idea of the nature of the beast when you're able to have developed friendships and, and you're known back and forth to be speaking clearly to one another. I said to him, Mikael, look, I'm going to do you a favor. Do not go down to Washington and take that position publicly vis-a-vis -vis President Bush because it's not going to fly. And you're going to be wounded because you're going to be turned down 
in this important, very important international meeting between you and the President of the United States. Find a way around it. Change your policies a little bit. Put some water in your wine and Bush will help you out. I also mentioned to him an, un an unknown little fact about NATO is that there's Article 2 of NATO that was, was drafted by, by Prime Minister Pearson, Foreign Minister Pearson at the time. And it's called the Canadian Article. And that allows NATO to be viewed both from, not just from a military point of view, but from a political point of view as well. And I referred him to that. That mollified him somewhat. And when he went down to Washington, rather than be humiliated by a firm no from the President of the United States, they got along and they maneuvered it so Gorbachev uh, came out of it, appearing anyway, to be uh, as a bit of a victory for him and a victory for Bush. Bush was indispensable. I mean, in, Bush was the one indispensable player in German reunification, apart from Cole himself. There's no doubt about that. And he, he conducted himself in such a way as to turn Gorbachev around. And you may remember that that summer at the G7 meeting in London, Gorbachev came in and I, I thought it was a laying down of arms of, uh, for the Cold War. And a couple of weeks after that, he was on holiday in Sochi and he was overthrown by the nut bars in the, in the Soviet military establishment. That goes to prove the kind of pressure that he was under and the vital importance of the roles played by Chancellor Cole and President Bush. Because without that, who knows what the generals in Moscow would have done. They already had him arrested and, 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 and imprisoned him in, in house, house arrest. And who, who knows what they would have done with the military. And it was, I think, that dialogue and that firm expression of Western values as articulated by President Bush, we were all available, of course, and able to make our own case, which we did. I did to him in Ottawa. Uh, but basically, I have always thought, as I look back on it, Gorbachev was vital because he didn't listen to his military advice, on the one hand. Bush and Cole were indispensable to make it happen in a positive manner. Professor, um, you talked about your childhood, obviously, right? I think you were born and grew up in, in Leipzig and then were given this opportunity as a result of reunification. When you look back and we've, you know, clearly the great successes uh, as a result of reunification, what problems have emerged from reunification? That is a very good question. I think that on the whole, I would call unification a success with footnotes. And I'm happy to elaborate on the successes later on, but I think there are maybe two problems um, that have also emerged um, as a result of reunification. And there were many successes so, uh, um, um, that I've mentioned earlier and that I can go into later. Um, so I think that one major problem is a stubborn persistence of wealth inequality between East and West Germany. And what that means is that household wealth in West Germany is still four times higher than in East Germany. And this has to do with higher home ownership rates in the West it has to do with a much stronger um, middle class and small medium sized enterprise culture in the West as opposed to the East where wealth gets inherited to future generations. And of course, West Germans had a 40 year head start um, over East Germans in terms of accumulating wealth. I think this is one aspect. And I wanna pick up on one of the prime minister's point from earlier again, which is uh, sort of this, this notion of takeover from the West um, over the East. And so the, the second problem, I think, is um, that West German elites and firms still dominate the country. And what that means is that there's not a single top 30 firm which has its headquarters in East Germany. So that is one major aspect. And even though East Germans uh, are 20% of the population, there are very few East Germans in leadership positions in Germany and, and even in East Germany. So it's true that we have an East German chancellor, Angela Merkel. But to give you a sense, there are zero university presidents from East Germany. Only 1% of federal judges are from East Germany. There's no single, not a single editor-in-chief of a major national newspaper. And um, only 2% of top management positions and businesses are held by East Germans. So, and the list continues. And I think that these inequalities in wealth and power result in the fact that 
many East Germans don't feel properly represented and recognized. So 57% of East Germans feel as second class citizens. And that, if I may, goes on to the other major problem, which is um, populism and far right politics in East Germany. And this is, um, of course, a serious problem in all of Western Europe and also in West Germany. But one thing stands out, the far right populist party, the alternative for Germany, is particularly strong in East Germany. Support for the AfD is about twice as high in the West as it is in, uh, sorry, twice as high in the East as it is in the West. And of course, this has many reasons and we can debate them uh, in the Q&A, such as the migration crisis, um, less experience with democracy, less experience with foreigners, a deep distrust towards the state, given the historical legacy in East Germany. But it's also a lot of protest voters against the inadequate representation uh, in German society, of East Germans in East German society and in parties. And, and particularly older generations um, may not share the sentiment that I expressed at the beginning, that it was mostly a success. Many feel as if they were losers after reunification whose world collapsed in 1990 because they had to experience some massive breaks with their biographies. But this is not to take away from the successes. I do want to reiterate that. I do think that unification was a success with footnotes, and I just mentioned the footnotes without elaborating on the on the successes very much. Well, you know, that's that's us in the media, right? We just we just go for the bad news. We we don't want the good news. We just want the bad <laughs> news. You've made your point, uh, and, and you've been clear about the uh, the su successes outweigh the um, concerns, uh, and you've expressed those concerns. And we may get uh, back to some of that later, Senator. I want to bring you in on on one of the issues that is is of particular concern for you and one you spent an, uh, an awful lot of time on. You've worked to improve newcomer integration practices in Canada and you've helped your counterparts in Germany on this. Can you give us a snapshot of what drew you personally to this area? Well, it's life. It's a series of happy and unhappy accidents. I was born in India. I went to study in Germany. Uh, I met my life partner hiking up the Bavarian Alps. Uh, went with him to Iran, fled Iran, found refuge and safety and security in this wonderful country. But in the 1970s, if you had asked me where I really wanted to live, it would have been Germany. But Germany at that point was not an immigration country. Um, so I'm delighted that I can do this kind of thing whilst keeping my friendship with Germany alive. Um, I believe that Germany and Canada are, and, and this conversation about migration and integration will be essential for Germans to grapple with as they look at the next 30 years as a unified. It's important to understand that, that we have been on the same journey, except Canada started this a good hundred years ago even before 1907, when we brought forward, when we brought hundreds of uh, cold weather farmers from Germany to settle the West. Uh, Germany in comparison, you know, because of its history of guest workers and Spätausiedler, uh, they only became a country of immigration in 1990. So on the one hand, Germany can look to us for our experience, and our mistakes, and we've made many of them, but we can look to them for freshness, inventiveness, and innovation. We also have something else in common. I think German policymakers and politicians who believe in migration as part of the economic future of a country and believe in integration understand that you need to have the hearts and minds of people on side. And this is where Canada has some experience. Uh, and again, you know, I'd be the first to admit there are no absolutes in this. Uh, we've made our mistakes as well. But one of the things we do really well, let me call it our secret sauce, uh, is our ability to translate the aspirations of immigrants and our aspirations for our country into reality, if not over the short term, at least over the long term. And you know, we, we like to say this and we say this informally, come to Canada, work hard, your children shall succeed. And, and, and what's the foundation of all of this? It's our public education system. Kids go into school as immigrants, they come out as Canadians. They go on to lead in medicine, science, technology, politics, culture. And this in turn serves 
us very well in providing that foundational support for immigration in this country. So in Germany, we are not quite there yet. Their school system has not uh, met the challenges of, uh, of migration. The teachers are not well prepared uh, to teach in multilingual schools. German uh, immigrant children are segregated so that they lean, learn German. We throw them into the classroom, we immerse them. And from my point of view, immersion will always work better than segregation. And they also have structural issues in their, in their system where you know, people are streamed into certain uh, vocations and opportunities. And it's very difficult for immigrant children then to uh, uh, achieve uh, a pathway to higher education. But well, I'd be, yeah. Well, I was just gonna say the, one of the challenges that Germany's had um, that we haven't had is simply by numbers especially in these last, what, five or six years. Germany's had, what, more than a million. Um, they welcome more than a million as a, resu a result of the migration crisis. So trying to be, trying to ha have a certain degree of order among their, say, education system with those kind of numbers must be incredibly challenging. I agree 100%. I don't know how Canada would have done if yeah a million people had arrived at our shores. So we need to give a real nod to Germany and to Chancellor Merkel when she said she will accept them. And then she said something that I, I, it's, I still remember it. To calm the people down, she said, wir schaffen das, which means we'll manage it in a very practical way. She said, we will put our arms around this. Now I've looked at the numbers and there are, you know, there are issues and certainly that kind of influx of new people will always create uh, disturbances. But one of the things that, that Germany did, possibly unintentionally, is to deal with its population problem as well. Uh, like Canada, it, is, it has uh, an age dependency issue. Um, and, and, you know, if we got a million people, uh, we would have suffered too, I think, and had some real expressions of dissatisfaction in our country. But we would have been further along the population uh, 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 policy agenda. So, you know, I, I think uh, that on this, we are the two countries that quite uniquely, along with Australia and New Zealand to some extent, stand, stand apart from others. We are open to immigration. We are open to uh, diversity and inclusion, but it would be so much better if we work together and learn from each other. Um, and, and I would hope uh, that as a result of this uh, symposium, we get some formal and informal collaboration going together. You know, I will say, well, we have to learn from Germany. What they do really well is they respect the trades. It, their children are proud to be mechanics and plumbers. All our immigrant children want to be doctors, lawyers, and engineers. We need mechanics and plumbers too. Maybe we have to have a real exchange of school systems here. Peter, if I may just say a quick word on Absolutely. what the senator has just mentioned. She's 100% right. Canada can only flourish with immigrants. Uh, when I became prime minister, I think the number of immigrants we accepted was somewhere around 80,000 a year. I increased it to 250,000, uh, the highest number in, in, in modern history. And that's the only way that we can, we can succeed because the immigrants, the waves of immigrants bring uh, knowledge, influence, uh, hard work, uh, family values. They bring all of these things that contribute to making Canada a better country. And uh, one of the things that uh, Chancellor Merkel did, I think she, that when she accepted all of the immigrants, the refugees, uh, over a million, I think, at, at one particular time, that she was providing moral leadership for Europe and the world. And that is not an insignificant commodity in, in, in international leadership. Uh, she, uh, she articulated, and she was an East German, and she articulated values that will live on in history when she explained and defended that decision to take, uh, take those immigrants in. I believe that Canada is going to become a, a big player only when we reach 75 million people. And I put that in when the Globe asked me to contribute to that series in the summer about uh, 
how I would see a post-COVID-19 Canada. One of the things uh, that I, I put out there was the need to enhance and increase our immigrants to the point where Canada one day soon, hopefully, uh, urge to go from say 40 million, we're flirting with 40 million people now, to 75 million. At 75 million, a lot more people take notice of you and your influence is enhanced considerably in the international matters we've been discussing. Yeah, I can. I remember that uh, comment in in the in the Globe piece, and uh, you know, almost doubling the size of our population is a really interesting uh, theory to throw out there because it would cause, as you can well imagine, a fair amount of debate. Uh, a good debate uh, yeah. for the country uh, for the country to have. Listen, we've got uh, we're into the kind of final stretch run here. And we've got a lot of questions uh, from the audience. Uh, I think we've got seven or eight hundred people at least uh, online, if if not more. The numbers are so small, even with my glasses, I can't <laughs> read them. But I think that I think that's what it says. Uh, so I'm going to ask these questions and kind of uh, bat them around through the three of you here. Um, and uh, for the, the lack of a better term, I'll, I'll call them short snappers. So the question will be short and hopefully the answers uh, will be so we can get to uh, as many of these as possible. Um, Professor, let me throw this first one at you um, and see how, how you deal with it. How do you think the concerns of some, such as the UK, about a reunified Germany in 1990 are perceived 30 years later? Um, I was, as I mentioned at the beginning, I think that those concerns were um, in many ways misplaced. And I think that, um, again, uh, Germany, is, um, uh, Germany has assumed a leadership position in the European Union in a, in a fairly reluctant way, again, for, its obvious, for very obvious historical reasons. But it has provided leadership um, throughout a number of crises. Now, at the same time, I can understand that Southern European countries, for instance, during the Eurozone crisis, have not been very happy with Angela Merkel's decision making. And, and so this is um, a, a concern I'm, I'm sympathetic about or sympathetic to. But at the same time, Germany has provided leadership throughout this crisis. And I think that that was um, um, positive. And on the UK, perhaps, one thing I would like to add is, of course, Brexit. Um, the UK is no longer part of the European Union. And I think um, we also talked about multilateralism at the first part of this conversation, and I do think that um, we need to um, strengthen the European Union in order to enhance multilateralism at the global stage. And during the Brexit negotiations, that was actually a case in point. And I thought that um, when the UK um, 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 was, uh, when the European Union was negotiating with uh, the United Kingdom in order to to produce Brexit. Um, the EU actually um, spoke with a single voice and, um, and pessimists were thinking that Brexit could lead to a collapse of the European Union. And even optimists thought that the Brexit would create a lot of internal divisions. But um, in fact, what we've seen is that France and Germany came together to provide a unified position and have very effective leadership towards Brexit. And for the UK, Brexit has meant um, that the UK has turned its back on multilateralism and as a result has um, um, faced political isolation and economic failure. And I think those are some of the lessons that we, we should take away from this. All right, uh, Senator, I'm gonna give you this one because it gives you a chance to uh, uh, respond in some manner to what the professor said uh, about 10 minutes ago. Here's the question. What are some of the tangible ways in which the German government can tackle the structural inequalities that exist in its eastern federal states, especially when compared to its western states. You know, Peter, I'm reminded of when I visited uh, East Berlin when I was a student in in Munich, and I walked into uh, you know out of the subway uh, and through uh, uh, a gate, and I was in a different country. And I remember that vividly. Um, it was the same language, but it was clearly a different culture, a different politics, a different people. I visit Berlin very often 
uh, and I see uh, the great changes that have been made uh, to that city as a symbol of that reunification between East and West. And I talk to people in the street and I, I think the East Germans um, to some extent have, uh, because there's only been one generation of East Germans, who are now Germans, who have experienced democracy in 30 years. The rest of them have never actually experienced democracy. And they look at what is happening uh, with, uh, uh, with a certain sense of loss almost. They see their symbols uh, no longer exist, uh, that the Volkspalast on Unter den Linden has, is now being reconstructed as the, in, in the image of the former palace uh, of the king. So I think, you know, outside the substantive uh, issues uh, and substantive ideas that Germany can take to bring former East Germany into the personality of Germany, it has to also pay attention to some of the symbolic uh, uh, gestures, uh, you know, recognizing uh, poetry, literature, film, uh, symbols, all of these things are very important. In terms of inequality, if it's, if, if we're talking about uh, economic inequality, uh, I would sort of brag a bit about what Canada has done recently, where we're putting money every month into poor children's hands. It, you know, it's the Canada Child Benefit has done an enormous uh, amount to lift poor family. It's not a universal uh, transfer. It's means tested. If you fall under a certain income level, every child in every family will get a certain amount of money. Uh, and that is a policy solution that I think others could well look at. Prime Minister, um, here's one for you. What does the future of the European Union look like, especially regarding the admission of new countries, given Germany's leading role in Europe? I think that they're lucky to have a Germany in such a commanding economic position in Europe, because since the uh, Schmidt and Kohl and Merkel and so on, um, and Schroeder, uh, those leaders have been uh, have been enlightened in their approach to Europe and to the world. Germany has provided that kind of leadership. I always thought, watching them very closely, Peter, that Helmut Kohl had given a moral proxy to François Mitterrand to speak on behalf of both countries because Kohl was conscious in those days, it's a long time ago now, he was conscious of, of the opposition to Germany that remained in countries like uh, the United Kingdom and so on. And Mitterrand used to speak on behalf of them, of both of them. But everybody knew that, that um, Germany was the emerging power and influence. And I look at the track record since the war and uh, the leaders that I've had the pleasure and the privilege of knowing and watching them in action. And I would say that, um, that the optimistic view of Europe and the world is in good hands in, in, in shared German leadership. Where the others have gone off the off, off this, the map are the British, with that decision to abandon Europe and to go the Brexit route. This, in my judgment, is one of the most stunning mistakes in modern British history, and will be so regarded, I think, in future. But meanwhile, you compare that with the steady and uh, visionary leadership of the Germans. And I think that Europe is happy that, or should be happy, to have an influential and powerful country uh, like um, the new Germany that has emerged. Uh, that, that's going to be very valuable for all members of the European Union. Uh, Professor, what measurable policies will Germany, and during its EU presidency in 2020, propose to lead global mobilization against climate change? That is a very good question. Um, I believe that the European Central Bank, for instance, has been considering the purchase of green bonds as part of its quantitative easing programs. This is, um, these are interventions in open markets to um, drive down interest rates and also stimulate the economy. And one way the European Central Bank can do this is by buying green bonds. And I think this is maybe one way that um, um, Christine Lagarde is pursuing 
um, in the future. And there, Ursula von der Leyen has also announced plans to have, um, in, in, to have um, green investments as part of the COVID uh, rescue fund, um, 750 billion. I, I believe that um, energy and green um, um, investments are part of this too in the, in the, in the next two years. Um, here's a question. I mean, uh, it, it's interesting, actually, that it's taken us more than an hour to hear this phrase, COVID-19, in this discussion today. But here is one. Uh, and it, in some ways, links, it links the, so, some of the issues that we've talked about here. The problems the international community faces today, COVID-19, climate change, et cetera, require a global response. But the pandemic has resulted in world leaders quickly turning their gazes inwards and focusing heavily on domestic policies to address the current crisis. Add this to the rise of global protectionism and populism. So here's the question. What are the effects of the current state of affairs on multilateralism? Are we so far gone from the time of hope and promise that saw the two Germanys unite? Senator? I think we have seen some interesting expressions of renewed interest in multilateralism. I'm an optimist. My name in Persian means hope. Uh, and I, I look at the, at, the, at the contributions to COVAX, uh, which, is, which is being uh, developed by the WHO. Canada has put money into it. Germany has put money into it. A lot of nation states have put money into it because we recognize that if we want to keep ourselves safe, we have to keep the world safe as well. So I think it, in a way, yes, we, as, as a first instance, we have turned inward and, and that is only natural in a way, this closing of borders and securing of PPE for ourselves, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it's also open an opportunity for those world leaders, and I would think Germany and Canada are, are, are in that group to contribute to the safety of the entire world. So I'm not uh, entirely pessimistic. I think out of chaos, innovation shall come. So I'm, I'm looking hopefully into the future. Professor, on that same question. Sure, and uh, I somewhat disagree um, with the premise of the question, in the, with, at least when it comes to the European Union. We have seen tremendous efforts, and I mentioned the, the COVID rescue fund, which is a 750 billion euro fund to help uh, European countries. And what's special about this is that European, um, the Germans in particular have always refused to sort of mutualize debt in the European Union. Um, 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 and, and what we've seen with the COVID rescue fund is that there was an enormous sense of solidarity to extend money in, in, form, in the form of grants and in the form of loans to those countries who need them. And it was a sort of a common underwriting of, of this uh, rescue fund. So I think this is something where the European Union actually did come together. And I would also add, as I mentioned earlier on, on Brexit, that the European Union spoke with a united voice and um, in those negotiations. So I do agree it's a turbulent world, but um, let's not um, forget about those um, instances where countries do come together and, and make a difference. Prime Minister, there's one directly for you here as well. It's uh, somewhat related. Uh, does the combination of Brexit and CETA, CETA is the arrangement between uh, Canada and the EU, right, on, on trade, I believe. Um, does it suggest that Canada will now look less to the Commonwealth and more to continental Europe? Well, most of our trade in that area is with continental Europe, uh, much less with the Commonwealth. Uh, 50 countries or so around the world. Uh, we have possibilities of important developments there, but one of the areas, Peter, given, you know, President Clinton used to say, leadership is the capacity to look around the corner of history just a little bit. And I think if you look around the corner of history, you'll see for Canada, with the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement followed by, the, by NAFTA, if Canada took the leadership as, as an experienced partner in this, uh, and I know that President Trump and others uh, disparage NAFTA, 
But NAFTA, is a, in, in terms of what we're talking about today, international cooperation, NAFTA is a grouping of three countries of 500 million people, 7% of the world's population. And with that 7%, we produce 29% of the world's wealth. So the formula is a winner, irrespective of what people might say at a given point in time. I would like Canada to assume the leadership with others uh, of the free trade area of the Americas, which would bring in 35 countries, a billion people, and a GDP of $33 trillion a year. Now, it's not going to happen tomorrow, and it's certainly not going to happen as long as Mr. Trump remains in the White House because he's not big on this kind of thing. But for Canada, I think it's a marvelous uh, possibility because if you can generate uh, all that wealth uh, with three countries, imagine what you're going to do with 35. And Canada is the most experienced country in this area. So I think that um, our future is not so much in that area. Uh, we've kind of exhausted that to some extent. But there are new, new markets, and, and uh, Latin America is one of them, and it can produce tremendous results, both for Canada and all the participants. Okay, I've got uh, about 10 minutes left, and, and, and actually quite a few questions, very good questions. Uh, I do want to remind the audience that uh, we are recording this, and it will be made available to all of you. You'll be notified um, by email uh, in the uh, next day or two where you can get it if you want to watch it all over again because <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> all right, uh, Professor, this question has been uh, sent in. I agree with your point on the EU as an anchor of multilateralism, but what does that mean in practice? A European army with an expanded German role, question, and how does one cope with the threats to the liberal order from within the EU, the Polish, and Hungarian governments, question. That is a great question. I do think, I, I agree with the premise of that question, and I do think that the um, Franco-German engine should do more to cooperate in the foreign policy and security framework for the European Union. Um, that involves an increased commitment to NATO, and it does involve more, def a, more cooperation in the realm of defense. And I think this is something that President Macron has um, demanded and, and promoted for years now. And I do think that um, the German government and Angela Merkel um, should come around to, to that idea um, a little bit more. I, I do think that that is a very important thing to do because you need to elevate the EU on the global stage in order to be um, um, a global player that can um, negotiate on equal footing with the United States, with China, with Russia, with Turkey, um, um, yeah, to um, solve global problems or negotiate them. Uh, Prime Minister, uh, another one to you, and it's kind of a challenge to you in a way. Um, you emphasize how important Gorbachev's acceptance of reunification was. In recent interviews, Gorbachev usually says he feels cheated by the West, not so much because of German unification, but because of NATO expansion to Eastern Europe. That eastward expansion violated promises given to Gorbachev at the time. Was this the main or a leading cause of alienation of Russia from the West, the rise of nationalism in Russia, and Putin's rise as Yeltsin's replacement? Well, it's probably a contributing factor, but uh, that occurred many years ago. Uh, and uh, there's been relatively little change in uh, NATO's financing or, or NATO's attitudes. Uh, I think that uh, President Gorbachev, uh, who has been very poorly treated at home, in spite of his tremendous leadership qualities, he's, he's had a bad, he's had a bad uh, number of years there. Because the Russians, still do not appreciate uh, the splendid nature of his, his proposals at that time and blame him for the bad news that had happened in the Soviet Union and in Russia. Uh, so I think that's, if I can say this respectfully to him, because I, I like him a lot, I respect him. This is a bit sour grapes because um, all of the damage to the Soviet Union was inflicted by the, by the Communist Party in the Soviet Union and now in, now in Russia. 
so I think that's, a, that's a, an unfair comment, if I can put it that way. Uh, he deserves a lot of credit for his leadership, and he hasn't gotten it so far, but he will in history. So I think that's the way I'd look at it, Peter. Uh, Senator, this one's for you. Uh, with your diverse background and from the perspective of your generation, what advice would you provide to younger generations to become agents of change and impact policy? That's a million dollar question. But uh, I think uh, young people embrace more readily uh, the world that we are in today than us older people. They embrace difference, they embrace uh, uh, diversity in ways uh, that our generation may have had problems with. So I think they're naturally uh, equipped uh, to deal with a brave new world. Um, and, and I'll give you a little factoid which will interest everybody. Um, all the indicators of integration in this country are interesting, but the one that is most interesting to me is, uh, uh, is the relationships and the marriages between races in Canada. And they are in urban centers at, they're, they're going higher and higher and they're producing children that look you know, like, like the brave new world. So I would say to the young people, embrace difference, engage locally. It's always important to engage uh, locally first and to understand what, what policy, what the implications and the impact of policy from the federal government or the global world order is on the lives of people and, and, and generate enthusiasm from change from the experience and observation of the lived experience. That's been sort of my story. It's not the only narrative, but that's the way I have certainly engaged with change. Prime Minister, um, this one's for you. It's from John Noble, the former uh, Canadian diplomat. And that great, that he was a great ambassador and public servant. Absolutely. Here's his question though. <laughs> Well, I have to take back my compliment. <laughs> well, I'm not kidding. At the May 1989 NATO summit in the heat of the debate on short-range nuclear weapons, you reminded President Bush in a plenary session of all NATO leaders, uh, just a sec, bad time to get a phone call on my phone. Um, you reminded President Bush in a plenary session of all NATO leaders that leadership to be effective has to take account of the views of others. Bush and Baker listened on SNF and German unification. The current incumbent of the White House appears less inclined to listen. How can any Canadian politician get the same type of relationship in Washington that you had? Well, we had excellent relationships with President Reagan and President Bush and President Clinton both the ones I work with. And um, we always articulated the Canadian view of things and our lessons of our history. And they were generally uh, speaking well received and certainly listened to, that's for sure. And, uh, but as I mentioned earlier, Peter, that's the kind of relationship that irrespective of the setbacks and the different personalities, the Prime Minister of Canada must work overtime to ensure that that privileged access to the presidency and the Oval Office is preserved, because without which, there, there are a lot of things that, you, that, that can't be done and won't be done. Now, dealing with George Bush or Ronald Reagan, uh, and I've said this before, uh, Justin Trudeau has a much more difficult job than I had, because I was dealing with, with people who were internationalists, they were free traders, uh, they were they consulted the Allies, and they were pro-Canada. And so I had a relatively easy time of it compared with the Prime Minister today. But in spite of the difficulties, you know, we're five weeks away from an election down there, who knows what's going to happen. Nothing is forever. And so uh, we have to maintain, and the Prime Minister has to maintain, an optimistic view of the relationship, because so many things, good things, can happen uh, when the U.S. and Canada are in sync on these major international issues. So I would encourage the Prime Minister, even though he gets knocked down 
from time to time. And some of the president's advisors are, have made nasty comments about him and about Canada. I dismiss that. I disregard that completely and stick to the main show. The main show is the relationship between the president and the prime minister. There was one last question for you here. I'm not sure who sent this one in. Prime Minister, are you sure we can't convince you to run again? <laughs> well, I said I, I mentioned the other day, Peter, that, that that when I was in office, and John Noble will remember this, when I was in office, uh, Mahathir Mohammed uh, was the Prime Minister of uh, Malaysia. And two years ago, he made a comeback as prime minister at 92 years of age. So <laughs> I've just turned 81. So, <laughs> so I'm wondering, is, is it too late for a comeback? <laughs> because he made a good run at it. <laughs> but no, I, I think that uh, I think I had my time and uh, was very happy and privileged to be able to do it. And now I'm happy just to look back and watch the others uh, strut their stuff on the world stage. Yeah, it sounds very familiar. It's the kind of thing I say, too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> professor, but, Peter, but Peter, they miss you when you're gone. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they don't miss you when you're there. They miss you when you're <laughs> there. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, it's a quick final word from uh, both the professor and the senator. Let's, let's start with the professor. Just on, you know, what we've kind of discussed in the last 90 minutes, if you can just pull perhaps one thread out of that and give us a uh, a concluding remark from your perspective. Of course. Um, I think, so I want to come back to this notion of success with footnotes. I want to expand on actually what we have achieved from, from an inside German perspective. And I think it's important to remember that 30 years ago, East Germany was in really bad shape. The economy was uh, crumbling and so was infrastructure. There was mass unemployment, dramatic population decline and environmental devastation. And today, East Germans are much better off. East Germany is much better off. The quality of life has improved and, and so have to, has the standard uh, of living, right? So there has been strong revitalization efforts, and infrastructure, urban renewal. Cities like Berlin, Leipzig, and Dresden are booming and growing again. And unemployment is fairly low in the East German context. So, and there are even areas where East Germany is now outperforming the West in terms of educational outcomes um, that you can read in the PISA studies and also in terms of childcare. Um, so it's true that the East German economy is still a little bit weaker than the West German economy, 25% weaker, but it's um, catching up. In the 1990s, it was 60% weaker. And um, let's not forget that West Germany was one of the richest and most competitive economies in the world. So it takes, it takes um, something to catch up uh, with that standard. Household income is still 12% lower, but it used to be 30 to 40% lower. So I think there is, um, importantly, that gap is closing, and despite the immense cost of unification, right, which was a, around 2 trillion euros, which is a number that is comparable to the size of the Canadian economy, Germany has um, actually managed to become, um, you know, an economic superstar, given, despite all these costs and despite all these challenges that also the ambassador mentioned in the very beginning, all the uncertainty, there was no blueprint to, to do these things. So, so given all that, I think um, uh, uh, we, ha we have to remember also the context in with, with, within which this was taking place. And, and, and so, um, uh, and I mentioned the footnotes earlier that, we, that more work needs to be done, right, in terms of countering populism and countering inequality. But on the whole, I think reunification was um, a very good thing for Germany, Europe, and uh, the, multi the liberal order. Thank you. And Senator, you get the last word. Thank you, Peter. You know, I've come away from this panel understanding how important the relationship between Canada and Germany is and how strong it is. And it has many ways to become even stronger. Uh, you know, for one, Canada looks forward to the ratification by Germany of CETA. It's a matter of time, but, you know, strong trade relationships are important for, for collaboration. Um, you know, I'm, I, remember, I remind myself that 10% of Canadians count themselves as, as ethnic Germans. So there's a very strong bond between our two countries and great potential for 
becoming stronger together. I, because there are so many students on this call, at least I hope there are, I'll give, I'll, I'll give, a, sh give a, a shout out to those students who travel overseas to study. And, and that is one of our problems in Canada. We have a wonderful Canada-Germany student exchange, yet the flow of traffic is more from Germany to Canada. And the students that seem to go from Canada to Germany uh, are, are interested in, in Germanistic, uh, but we should have a very strong exchange of students in STEM and other, uh, other uh, areas as well. Uh, so, you know, I've come away from this thinking that, uh, yes, we have our multilateral and our bilateral uh, associations. We, I'm a member of the Canada-Germany French Friendship Group, uh, which is sort of an informal group of people. We could make it stronger. Uh, and, and hopefully in the next three or four years, we will become stronger uh, so that we can have these kinds of formal and informal exchanges on matters of trade, human rights, uh, right-wing extremism, disinformation. These are all issues that Canada and Germany can work together on and, and, and do better if we work together as opposed to individually. Thank you. Let me, um, let me just give a couple of concluding remarks uh, and they're mainly thank yous to our uh, wonderful panelists here. Uh, and a thank you to the Monk School and a thank you to the ambassador for, for allowing us uh, this time. Um, one of the things that's always I guess puzzled me about our country is in terms of Canada is that we tend to be shy about our accomplishments. Um, and we tend to think, Oh, you know, maybe we're overstating what we, what we did in certain areas. Well, I don't, I don't think we do. I don't think we overstate them enough um, because you can go through our history over the past 150 so years uh, where there have been particular achievements that happened beyond our borders, but happened because of our involvement in them. And I think that uh, Prime Minister Mulroney and his government deserve credit as credit has been given by other governments to Canada for its role in this particular uh, issue of German reunification. Um, I've also, I was, you know, I was, I was in South Africa when they buried Nelson Mandela and the prime minister uh, was there and we managed to speak for a, a few minutes at that time. And I can tell you that in that country, um, uh, there are a few people from outside South Africa uh, who receive as much credit for first the uh, freedom granted to Nelson Mandela um, after a long uh, time in jail at a time when many of us thought he'd spend the rest of his life in jail, uh, but also to the end of apartheid. Uh, as Michael Sabia mentioned at the beginning of, the, of, of this, uh, it was a uh, it was a proud moment uh, for Canada to be so involved in uh, the events surrounding South Africa's uh, coming of age and the freedom of uh, of Nelson Mandela. And as a result, Prime Minister Mulroney has been awarded um, some of, if not all, of the highest uh, medals of recognition uh, by the South African government. So that is another thing that Canada. Uh, through uh, the Prime Minister uh, was involved with and, and it's something that we can be proud of. But on this day, we celebrate our role in the uh, unification, the reunification uh, of the two Germanys on uh, 30 years ago tomorrow, I guess, is the official anniversary. And uh, thank you for watching all this. Once again, if you have the opportunity, you can, um, uh, you will get an email of some sort to let you know that uh, you can get a recording of today's events. And uh, we thank you for your attention and for watching and listening. And once again, I thank all of the panelists for their uh, terrific insight into this story. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you.